One of the aspects of meditation is that it has a profound effect on the body and mind. And we know that because it is, it is so studied. We've, um, there have been over 10,000 studies on the effect of mindfulness or meditation on the brain and on the physiology. So we know that people who meditate have a little more resilience. Um, there's more a sense of the being less stressed so the, the body functions operate better. There's more emotional equilibrium, more mental clarity, um, a more refined sense of intuition, and a more refined sense of empathy. All this stuff has been studied and quantified. So we know that if you meditate, you will, you'll find yourself in a, in a place of feeling more optimal. But it's also a very, very powerful way to really explore the nature of reality and who you really are. It's been said that there, there are two basic paths, two basic spiritual paths. One is the path of means, which is becoming better, you know, becoming more flexible, becoming healthier, becoming a better listener, becoming a better partner, becoming more organized. All of that is good. It's all about how we can improve the quality of our lives. And uh, meditation definitely does that. Another path is the path of liberation, the path of, of cutting through, the path of really identifying who and what you really are. That's a different path and a very powerful way to apply mindfulness. Some forms of meditation are all about concentration, getting very, very present. And you may have experienced, as you were doing the slow motion meditation perhaps, uh, maybe a little bit of a sense of absorption. You know, there's so much going on, the mind gets very, very engaged, it turns inward, you get very, very calm, and you're really drawing your attention to the here and now. And all the concentration practices are enormously powerful. They, they train your mind in a dynamic way. They allow you to stay when it's really going, when it's tough, but they also open up different states of consciousness and different, different levels of consciousness open in direct proportion to your capacity to stay present. Very, very powerful. But as I've said before, there are a lot of very concentrated people on the planet who are miserable. So concentration is a tool but it doesn't necessarily provide insight. It doesn't necessarily give you uh, any perspective on who you are. So one of the things I love about the practice of, of Vipassana meditation is that while it uses concentration as a way to, to gather your attention here, when something arises that is really challenging, and that could be physical pain, it could be emotional turbulence. It could be mental obsessing. Anything that, that is really disturbing, there is a formula that you can apply where you actually turn your attention from your anchor, whether it be the breath or sound or the feeling in your body, to investigate the phenomena itself. And this is enormously powerful and very practical. Um, a little story of someone, a friend of mine, who um, was, had a sleepover for her seven-year-old daughter. So she had seven seven-year-olds. I'm seeing a number of you just imagine seven seven-year-olds. Gets a little crazy. And they were really, really excited about something. And, you know, the, the sound level just got louder and louder and louder. And she was just about to explode. And she, had, she was so angry and felt so overwhelmed. And like, why did I do this? And I don't have anyone helping me. And um, she was about to go into the room and scream, everyone needs a timeout. But just before she did that, she thought, I need a timeout. <laughs> and she actually stepped, she sort of stepped away, kind of went into her bedroom and just took a few moments to 
to sort of recognize what she was feeling, which was, you know, anger and overwhelm and frustration. And, and she just sat with it for a little bit, gave it a little bit of room, a little bit of space. And then she just sort of sensed, so how, do, how, how does this, what does this need right now? And she realized she just needed a little bit of, a little bit of time to breathe. And so she just breathed and she felt that, you know, the anger, the frustration, the overwhelm, not like it went away, but it shifted. Have you ever had that experience of, of moving from being, being angry to being with your anger? Suddenly you're not as identified, you can witness it. So she sort of recollected herself, didn't, didn't take that long. And she went back into the room to join the girls and she found out to her surprise and a little bit of horror that the reason why they were so excited was they were making a gift for her. That's the power of investigation, of stopping yourself from a habitual way of reacting. Stopping, looking what's going on. So there are four main questions you can ask yourself, ask yourself at any time. And I'd like to kind of cover these. And if we have some time, it'd be nice to maybe take a little bit of sharing if there's time. So it's, these are the questions, the inquiries that can shift your relationship to what's happening, particularly when you feel caught. And again, physical pain, emotional turbulence, mental states. The first question is, what is happening right now? This is the path of recognizing or realizing what's actually here. And of course, that's what we do in meditation just as you did over this 30 minutes of recognizing, oh, my mind has gone off again. Oh, I'm falling asleep, whatever it may be. It's the, the, your capacity to recognize what is true in your experience. For, for this woman, for my friend, she recognized it as anger. But it's never just anger. Along with the anger was a sense of overwhelm, a sense of a sense of anxiety, feeling exasperated. So I always get treated to these wonderful experiences before I'm about to give a Dharma talk. As I was driving through McLean, someone in a black SUV just cut me off. And um, I immediately went into revenge mode. I'm stunned at, at how my personality completely changes. Most people think of me as kind of a calm, relaxed person, but behind the wheel in the DC metro area, it's another story. And I found myself wanting to, you know, let this person know they had wronged me, you know? So I, I sped up, you know, for, for whatever reason. <laughs> And, and I just, for, I'd say for about two minutes, I was totally caught in a story of what a jerk this person was. And then I remembered I was giving this talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, so what's happening? What's actually happening right now? And I realized I was, I was in total anger, revenge, this person must be punished mode. But then I realized it was more than just a thought. I had adrenaline in my body, you know? My, my body was like, it, went, it was in fight mode. I felt uh, my, my heart pulsing, I felt my pulse elevated. I was in a high state, of, high state of alarm. And it's interesting how just by noticing it, it began to shift. And just as for my friend, as soon as she noticed she was angry, it began to shift. What we develop in this capacity is, in some traditions, called the witness. It's your capacity to observe. And mindfulness is the practice of non-judging awareness, which is a very, very rare place to be, to actually observe your experience without judgment. But when you can do that, you disidentify from your experience. Maybe not completely, but maybe a little bit. As I said, perhaps ad nauseum, in the shamanic traditions, they say when you can name a fear, you take its power away. 
as soon as I could name my anger and my revenge, it didn't have the same grip because I had named it. So this capacity to recognize, to identify what's happening right now is a very, very powerful tool. It is the tool that helps you shift from being, being the reactor to being the observer and then your capacity to respond. So of course, when we pay attention, there's a lot going on. And I thought I might leave just a brief reflection, just a, a few minutes, if you'd like to close your eyes. I'd like to take you through a little experiential review of what are called the four foundations of awareness. That when you pay attention to your internal experience, there is a lot going on on four fundamental levels. The first foundation is the direct experience of energy inside. You might take a moment just to contact what are you feeling on the inside? Can you identify what sensations are the most predominant right now? This raw experience of here and now without labels, very quickly, without us knowing it, will begin to form into the second foundation. It's called Vedana. It's the felt sense. And as you observe your experience on the inside, you might like to distinguish three basic characteristics of feeling. Can you identify over these next few moments any sensations that are unpleasant? Can you identify any sensations that you find to be pleasant, enjoyable? You might say hello to those. Is it possible to distinguish your experience of sensations that are neither pleasant nor unpleasant or neutral sensations? Out of this experience of the raw data of sensation forming in the pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral sensations, we move into the third foundation of awareness, which is the realm of thought forms. Thought forms can include beliefs, emotional states. Is there any particular emotion that is dominant right now? Can you name that, say hello to that? Any predominant belief or type of thought? And the fourth foundation is referred to in in Pali as the Dhammas, which is the recognition of what is true. And you might just sense how in your experience, perhaps just the sense the three characteristics of reality, that everything you feel and notice is changing. That how you relate to what is changing determines the degree to which you will feel stress or suffering. and to sense perhaps the quality of, of who you are is deeply impermeable and changing as well. Noticing everything in your experience, ranging from the raw data of sensation, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, different thoughts, different states.
And when you're ready, you can deepen the breath. And when you're ready, you can let your eyes open or you can remain with them closed if you prefer. Self-observation without judgment. And recognizing that as you observe your experience, that there are different streams that are constantly flowing. Just the sounds around you, beyond your control, coming and going. The sensations in your body, the thoughts, the beliefs, moods, different states of consciousness, they're, they're all changing. Of course, the essential guideline in this particular tradition is to guide your attention back to the first foundation, to that raw experience in the here and now. From there, as we rest there, we can watch this chain of proliferation. As I've mentioned before, how this experience of the moment moves into pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. From there, you have a thought. If you think the same thought over and over and over again, it becomes a belief. A belief is nothing more than a repetitive thought. If you're not aware of that belief, it'll become a habit. If you're not aware of the habit, it becomes installed in your character. And if you're not aware of it in your character, it becomes your destiny. So we can pay attention in, on any one of those levels, but the, the radical practice is to come back to the very foundation again and again and again. So this whole capacity to recognize what's happening right now develops wisdom. And wisdom is the recognition of what is true. It takes a lot of courage. Because when you begin a meditation practice or you're deeply engaged into your practice, Everything unresolved in your life will come to the surface because it's, it wants to be more whole. So sometimes I describe this practice of meditation as a deeply humiliating experience in the best possible way. Because we get to recognize where we're caught, where we hold back, where we withhold, where we judge, where we compare. You get to see it when you pay attention. The next question is really what allows us to be in that experience, which is, can you be with your experience? There's a classic teaching story of, of Ajahn Chah, who was uh, considered one of the real masters of, of Vipassana meditation. He was Jack Kornfield's teacher. And uh, the story is that when people would come to meditate in, in his community, that he would just walk around and, and he would only ask two questions. The first question, he would just say, tell me about your suffering. And people would say, well, I'm, I'm working with this, I have this pain, I have this issue. And he would listen. And then he, he would ask the second question. And he would say, can you bear it? Can you be with it? Sometimes people would say, I can. It's hard, but, but I can be with this. Some, sometimes people say, I can't be with this. And then he would always say, you have rope burn. You're holding onto the rope too tight. So for me, as I was driving here and recognized I was in revenge mode, I asked myself, can I make room for this? Can I make room for this, this anger right now? And I was able to do that. It was like I made a little bit bigger space for my experience just by saying, okay, I'm gonna make room for this. And then it, then it seemed kind of silly, but my, identi my identification shifted when I did that. So meditation has been described as a two-part definition. It's developing your capacity to Notice what's happening while it's happening. But it's also noticing your relationship to what's happening. 
noticing the attitude in your mind, noticing anywhere that you're pushing away, anywhere you're holding on. It's about noticing that too. And asking again, can I be with it? I think it was two years ago, I was, um, I joined a, a small group, a meditation group, and we were sort of sharing about what was going on. And I actually heard myself say this. Um, I said, my mother had just died. Um, my dog had just died of, of 15 years. I, we had just put my father in an Alzheimer's unit. And so I, I described that, but then I said, but you know, I'm feeling great. I, I, really, I really feel good. And I was really struck by that. But in that moment, though, there was so much happening that there was something inside that really was okay about it. So I'd like to lead again another brief reflection, kind of a little experiential exploration into this, this capacity to, to be with or to allow. So you might like to close the eyes and just deepen the breath. And you might just first ask yourself, what am I experiencing right now? And you might sense if you can actually give your experience a name. Can you find one or two words that describe your experience? And then you might explore what it's like to say no to your experience, to, to kind of push it away, to push it down. What does it feel like inside to say no? And now explore what it's like to say yes. What does it feel like inside to say yes to what you're experiencing? To make room for it, to give it space. And when you're ready, you can deepen the breath. letting your eyes open or remaining with them closed. When you've named your experience, when you've asked yourself, can I make room for it? Can I be with this? We then turn to a very interesting part of the inquiry. And that is, can you be more intimate with your experience? This is the story of the Buddha. Apparently the, the Buddha, according to literature, had a, had a bad back. And uh, he had a fair bit of back pain in his life. And uh, the story goes he was, uh, that sometimes people would call him um, elephant ears. <laughs> and it might have been because his, ba his, his back or his neck was stiff. But it, supposedly when you, turn, when you ask the Buddha a question, he would turn his whole body so that he could, he could hear what you had to say. So he, he gave you this full attention. And that's really what, what investigation or intimacy is about. It's about giving your experience your full attention to really move closer, move more intimately into what's happening. So for me, as I was driving the car, as I was in revenge mode, made more space for it, I actually took a little bit of time like, okay, so, so what's this like? And I, and I noticed just how much I was feeling on the inside. Again, like the adrenaline, the kind of the clenched fist. And I was aware that I was also kind of like, I had this belief like this person was wrong and needed to be punished. By, by looking a little bit closer, by being more intimate with it, there was a shift, as I had mentioned. 
I wasn't, I wasn't as identified with my experience. So there's a whole art to investigation, particularly when you find yourself caught in a strong emotional state or a mental state. We tend to want to hang out on the level of thoughts to try to figure out what's going on, come up with a solution. The radical invitation is to investigate that first foundation. What does it feel like on the inside? Can you be intimate on that level, that kind of primal level of, of your experience? This is a lot of times where in our practice we encounter some difficulty. We experience a lot of resistance and we don't want to look. We really don't want to see what's there. And so we, we turn away from it, we harden it, we, move, we, we freeze it away. The challenge is that when you feel that you can, to bring your attention to whatever that may be. You know what it's like when you have a, maybe have a, a filling in your tooth, and while they're kind of preparing the preparation for the filling, your tongue goes right to that spot over and over and over again? We, our minds tend to fixate on what's not working. Tends to, we tend to fixate on the pain. Investigation can be a very powerful way to sort of shift your attention to what's, to what's happening. So the fourth question is, can you shift your relationship to what's happening? When we can move, when we can name our experience, when we can allow it, when we can really look deeply into the nature of it, you may find organically your relationship shifts a little bit. Part of what investigation begins to bring forth is a recognition that it's changing. It's always changing. There's a little riddle that says, what are, the, what are the four words that can make a happy person sad and a sad person happy? The four words, this too shall pass. And when you are caught in physical pain, emotional turbulence, a mental state that feels really difficult, usually what we do is we don't want to look. When the conditions are right, and you can recognize what's there. If you have the capacity to say yes to it, sometimes it's too much, and it's very skillful to not say yes to it. But when you can deeply investigate it, you'll begin to see that it's changing, that it's shifting. And you'll begin to see that your, your suffering or your stress is directly related to how you're holding your experience. If you have pain and you resist, there will be suffering. The equation P times R equals S. You can have a little bit of pain and a lot of resistance and a lot of suffering. You can have a lot of pain and very little resistance and very little suffering. I once did a meditation when I had a terrible migraine. And it occurred to me that as I was observing my experience in a pretty helpless state, because it was quite overwhelming, how my mind would go back again and again and again to the pain. And I thought, what if I explore the other aspects of, of sensation? So I began to look for anywhere in my body that I felt pleasant sensation. There was, there was a little bit, a couple places where I could find some pleasant sensation. Then I looked where I could find neutral sensation. And I, and I had a little insight and I realized that 94% of my body actually felt okay. 6% was on fire and freaking out. But I hadn't noticed that 94. And by exploring that, that 94%, it actually began to shift my relationship to the 
perhaps we can do a, a, just a brief reflection and kind of explore these four, four questions. You might deepen the breath. What is your experience right now? Can you find a word or two or three that, that describe or modify what's happening right now? Can you be with this? Can you let this be? And if you can, how does it shift or change or move? Your capacity to recognize and name your experience is the flowering of wisdom, to recognize what is true. Your capacity to be with it, to let it be, is the flowering of compassion, and the lubrication that allows you to be with and let go what is here. And you might explore for a minute or two, can you move your attention more intimately into what's happening, whatever it may be. How intimately can you feel the breath? And can you contact the aliveness inside? Can you sense who you are as the witness? to be both intimately present and at the same time to let your experience flow. If you like, you can deepen the breath and letting your eyes open if you like. Your capacity to recognize what's happening, to make room for it, to turn toward your experience, allows you to Release yourself into your life. Sokni Rinpoche, who is uh, a wonderful Dzogchen teacher, said that as you practice with sincerity and as you work with challenges as they arise, you will become more confident. You will begin to recognize that you have a capacity to be with anything, no matter how challenging. Joseph Campbell has these, uh, these words on working with challenges when they arise. He says, whatever your fate is, whatever the hell happens, you say, this is what I need. It may look like a wreck, but go at it as though it were an opportunity, a challenge. If you bring love to that moment, not discouragement, you will find strength there. Any disaster you can survive is an improvement in your character, your stature, and your life. What a privilege. This is when the spontaneity of your own nature will have a chance to flow. Then, when looking back at your life, you will see that the moments which seem to be the great failures, followed by the wreckage, were the incidents that shaped the life you have now. You'll see this is really true. Nothing can happen to you that is not positive. 
even though it looks and feels at the moment like a negative crisis, it is not. The crisis throws you back, and when you are required to exhibit strength, it comes. So this practice of meditation has tremendous benefits. The resilience to your nervous system, your emotional equilibrium, your mental clarity. There are also times when the practice of mindfulness, and particularly when you encounter difficulty in life, these questions can be really, really helpful. To recognize what is happening, what's actually happening, not your story, not your embellishments, not your preferences. To really, truly want to know what is true. To ask yourself, can I be with it? To explore what it means to open, to say yes to your experience. To ask if you can be more intimate with your experience. To truly turn your attention to it with, with true curiosity. And when you can do that, there is a wonderful quality of natural awareness your capacity to, to access the witness, that non-judging nature, results in a sense of, of greater wisdom and a sense of greater compassion. So our time has flown. Uh, thank you for your, your kind attention to this. I hope, I hope this was helpful. The, the, these practices have been so helpful for me. And uh, it's, as someone said the other day, you know, these, these practices are so powerful, the challenge is to remember them. But eventually we do. Why don't we close with a, just a short, brief reflection. And these two elemental questions you can ask any time. What is happening right now? Can I be with this? You might reflect on the cumulative effect of taking this time to pause, to slow down. And we'll explore just a short meditation on the offering of merit. whatever merit, whatever benefit you may have generated through your practice from this day, you might offer that benefit, that merit to yourself. That your path may be filled with a sense of ease, whatever merit, whatever benefit you've generated this day, you might offer it freely to those in your inner circle. May these beings benefit. Offering it out now to those you work with, those you live with. May these beings benefit from the fruit of your practice. And like a light in the night sky radiating in all directions, you might offer this out to all beings in all directions without discrimination. May all beings experience a sense of freedom, a sense of peace. And as you offer this outward, you might offer it again to yourself, to this breath, and to each cell in your body. And 
And as you're ready, deepening the breath. And when you're ready, letting your eyes open.